Hello, in this episode we're going to continue our analysis of theories of growth and development overall. We're beginning our review of chapter four now, in which, having looked at the classic four theories and general approaches to economic development, we're turning our attention to some contemporary ideas that have become very influential. In particular, the idea of underdevelopment as a coordination failure. Specifically, coordination failures can occur when agents, such as firms, but it could be households, inability to coordinate their actions together leads to an outcome that makes all agents worse off. So in other words, there's two possible outcomes, two equilibria, one preferred, but you may not be able to get to it. This can occur when actions of agents, such as how much to invest, are complementary. So here, one agent, actions taken by one agent, reinforces incentives up for action, for similar actions by other agents. We're going to see examples in the social sphere, the more social sphere, um, as we go through the course. An example when we get to population has to do with fertility, that is to say, in some rural area, as some families, or, or traditionally, some families or all families are having large numbers of children, there's an incentive for newly forming families, say, to also have large numbers of children. But the same might work in reverse, that when the average number of children is small, there's an incentive for other families also to have smaller numbers of children. Here, we're looking at a different problem. It has to do with investment. When other firms are investing a lot, there's an incentive for individual firms to invest more also. As I said, this is possible when there is complementarity. So before looking at the first diagram, I'm going to look at some basics of what underlie this notion of complementarity. In the problem that I've just described, we have to consider a relationship between the average amount of investment spent undertaken by other firms in the economy and the response, the reaction of any one typical firm. So then on the y-axis, we're looking at the expected average investment. Whereas on the y-axis, we're looking at the best investment response. And by best, we typically mean in this kind of analysis, what is most profit maximizing. The profit maximizing response to what's seen in the overall average amount of investment activity in the economy. When there's complementarity, this relationship is upward sloping, as you see here. That is to say, the more the average expected investment across the economy, the more the firm is going to find its best response in terms of profit maximizing investment level for itself. So for example, it may be that even if other firms are not expected to invest anything, a firm might decide to invest something perhaps because it has opportunities to export what it produces to some other region as an example. But overall, as the expected average amount of investment increases in, in economy, looking at the other firms, the other relevant firms, this is positive sloping because based upon profit maximizing considerations, the firm decides to um, in fact invest more. So this is upward sloping. This is complementarity. Without complementarity, there will not be multiple equilibria. On the other hand, just because there is complementarity doesn't mean there will be. Or you could say that complementarity is a necessary but not sufficient condition for a multiple equilibria situation to emerge. So how do we think about equilibria in this situation? The common way to represent it graphically is very straightforward. It's with a 45 degree line. So our 45 degree line is a set of situations in which if we think of the firms as being symmetric, when the average investment level corresponds to what's profitable for each individual firm to invest, 
This is the condition in which we find in equilibrium. And so perhaps it's not surprising for those of you who've been studying economics that in diagrams of this kind, the equilibrium is found where curves cross. However, let me go through some of that in just a bit of detail. I'm not going to prove this with algebra, but we'll use a heuristic proof, similar to what we did when we talked about the solo model. In this case, I have proposed that the equilibrium is found at an average investment level, in which case each individual finds in response that that firm's profit will be maximized at the same um, rate. And so, in order to look at this, we'll do the kind of um, proof by contradiction, heuristic proof by contradiction approach that we did with the solo model. So, I'm asserting that this is what the equilibrium overall average investment rate is going to look like. And if that's not true, there's two alternatives. The two alternatives in general, or that the investment rate could actually be higher or could be lower. We'll just take the case of the lower investment level. This cannot be an equilibrium, however, because if each firm looks at the average level of investment and decides that it wants to invest in more than the average, that must be pulling the average up. How do we know that this is more than the average? The 45 degree line makes what's on the x-axis the same as what's on the y-axis. So if each firm is responding to the average by choosing to invest more than that average, we clearly cannot be in, it, in an equilibrium because each firm is finding it optimal, that is to say profit maximizing, to invest more. So we have to be moving this way. And the same logic will bring us all the way up to this point. Now, of course, you might say, well, why stop here? Shouldn't there be a possibility that an equilibrium is investing more. So to investigate that situation more, we'll just take a consideration of this expected level of investment. Well, this also cannot be an equilibrium because in this case, if the um, response, the best response of individual firms is at a rate um, that is lower than the average, and that is what it means to find this reaction function below the 45 degree line. The most profitable response is less than what's the expected average response. That can't be an equilibrium either, because there's now going to be inevitable reductions in the investment that we expect as we pay attention to what's being invested, what the investment plans are, indeed, it's that the um, individual investments being lower, it's got to pull down the average. And so we end up back with this equilibrium. So that this gives us the basic idea. But in contrast of these straight line um, or simple upward sloping reaction functions in which there's one equilibrium, there's a set of cases in which there will, there will be multiple equilibria. All of them have something to do with increasing returns. Of course, increasing returns is a hallmark of modern economy, so it's not too surprising that we find it relevant. But this is introduced in the first graph in Chapter 4, the figure 4.1. And with figure 4.1, we have a similar diagram to what I've just drawn. Here we have the expected decisions of other agents on the x-axis, but here it's the average investment level that we're focusing on at this point in the class. And on the y-axis, you have the privately rational response or reaction. And in this case, it's the individual response in investment level based upon what you expect the other firms are doing. Once again, we have the 45 degree line where, as we've just seen, that's where we're going to find the potential equilibria. When we did this, we found that the stable equilibria, as this one was, because if you start higher or lower, you come back to this, e to this uh, equilibrium, we found that it exists when you have this reaction function, the best response function, cutting the 45 degree line from above. Here, we have an S-shaped reaction function, 
And we see that there are two locations where this reaction function cuts the 45 degree line from above. That's found here, and it's found over here. And so these are going to be two equilibria, two local equilibria, based upon the same kind of reasoning that we had before. Now you might wonder what might give rise to this kind of relationship. There's many possibilities, and some of them are described in the text. One that I think is perhaps less expected and of great importance is this idea of learning by watching. That especially if you're in a developing country, the extent of knowledge about modern production techniques is less great. And so when you see around you examples of other firms investing, there's a lot to be learned in the process. And so if there is more average investment, the more possible opportunities are near you, the chances are higher that it's something you can learn from is nearby where you're located. And so it's not at all surprising that this relationship could be increasing at an increasing rate. But this does not last forever as eventually you start to run out of things you can learn from watching and observing what other firms are doing and their investment projects. And so some kind of diminishing returns starts to set in. And so that's what gives us this S-shaped kind of relationship in this case with that example of learning by watching. But you can see that there might be many other circumstances. For example, just the fact that other firms are investing more may very well mean that they're in a position to plan to buy more of your product. To be ready for that, you're going to invest to increase your capacity in looking ahead to that. So by the same logic that we gave before, that with a reaction function cutting from above, we know that this point labeled D1 and this point labeled D3 are both going to be stable equilibria. Now we have this other point in which the reaction function cuts the, the 45 degree line. It's labeled D2 in the diagram in the textbook. Is this or is this not an equilibrium? It's called an unstable equilibrium. I think it's kind of not really an equilibrium at all. It could exist by chance, but if the slightest disturbance were to occur, perhaps it would be something like an article in the Financial Times that turns out to have been a, um, an, an error, but that led individuals to think situations in the economy would, you know, off, would offer less, um, less profitable opportunities um, going forwards. This might lead us to expect less investment in the economy. If that happened, we'd shoot all the way down to this lower equilibrium. Similarly, maybe that story in the Financial Times was a little over-optimistic about profit opportunities, but nonetheless, according to the logic that we just went through in the previous diagram, we're going to shoot up all the way to this equilibrium. So that this central possible equilibrium, D2, I think more of as an economic divide. It divides possibilities in the economy of going to the lower or the higher equilibrium. And so you can also think of it in, in, a, in a sense of being like a divide. It's like the continental divide. You know, imagine Pike's Peak in the Rocky Mountains where a drop of water lands on the top of Pike's Peak, depending upon some kind of random circumstances like air currents or something, either that drop rolls in the direction, maybe doesn't make it all the way, and the direction of the Pacific Ocean, or it goes in the direction, let's say, of the Gulf of Mexico. So this is really like an economic divide, and that's the best way to, to think of it. And you can look for those wherever the reaction function is crossing the 45 degree line from below. And so notice that so far we have not really said anything specific about whether this equilibrium that is stable is better or worse than this equilibrium, which is for the same reasons, also stable. That's what we're going to do in the next episode, see a way that we can logically work out that indeed sometimes one of these is preferred to the other. You might guess that with higher overall investment, this might be the Pareto preferred amount, but there's no reason why this has to be the case. No economy wants to take all of its national investment and put it into its national income and put it into investment. And in fact, there'd be nothing for people to live on. That would be the end of your country. 
Um, so there's, it's not obvious that more investment is better. Consumption may be um, better in some circumstances. So we can't simply assume this is a better equilibrium, but we will look at the specific case in the big push model, as it's called, in which we'll see that in that outcome, the better equilibrium is in fact found at the higher levels of uh, investment for modern sector production. But we have to work that out. But the first thing that we have established here is the possibility that rather than a single equilibrium, developing countries might have more than one. And for some reason, they may be having a hard time getting from one to the other. And this is where the concept of the big push comes in. If you were at this lower equilibrium, and suppose that this were a better equilibrium, that high investment were, would be better, it really requires a very substantial increase, at least an expected investment, to get past this D2 point to avoid falling back to this lower equilibrium. Again, last thing to note, it was essential, it was an underlying feature that made this multiple equilibrium situation possible, that the reaction function was positive. That is to say that there was complementarity between actions. Other firms are investing more, it becomes profitable for us to invest more also. So with that introduction, I'm going to end this episode and we'll proceed next to look at the analysis of the big push. Thanks.